when we are developing any destinations where our people travel we develop the whole ecosystem where before anyone travels to any place so by destination development i mean we go to the place okay what is the accessibility status and what we can do whether temporary or permanent to make it happen uh and this involves uh, interacting and convincing the stakeholders which includes uh, the tourist places like museums or uh, forts and palaces or anything that the public institution that is public institution own or the hotels or the storytellers or the guides and the transport companies we train and sensitize all of them before anyone travels in that ecosystem welcome to another episode of the brand called you a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons knowledge experience and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world if you are new to our channel please consider subscribing to it and hit the bell icon so that you never miss an update i'm your host ashutosh garg and today i have with me um, a successful entrepreneur uh, partly from the social sector partly from uh, the regular sector neha arora neha welcome to the show My pleasure uh, Ashutosh thank you for having me and thank you for such a nice introduction i appreciate that thank you aneha is the founder of planet abled uh, focusing on providing accessible and inclusive travel solutions for people and persons of all types of disabilities she is the recipient of the national award in tourism so no aneha tell me a little bit about planet abled so planet abled um, uh, promotes the concept of inclusive travel for people of all types of disabilities and the elderly it's more about giving everyone the freedom of choice to travel the way they want mm-hmm. uh whatever uh the disability or impairment might be so they could be a wheelchair user blind deaf have autism or if have any other psychosocial cognitive or intellectual disability mm-hmm. they can choose to travel solo or go on a romantic getaway or travel with their friends family mm-hmm. or go for adventure trips like rafting or skiing or hiking okay and uh, when we talk of inclusive travel the group trips that we do are always inclusive mm-hmm. when we say inclusive we mix people with various disabilities and non disabled to travel together mm-hmm. because why should disability be the defining factor whom you travel with and in what group do you travel correct well said and what was your motivation to start a venture like this so it came out of my personal experience because both my parents are persons with disabilities mm-hmm. so my father is blind and mother is a wheelchair user and we never went for a holiday as mm-hmm. the kids and when i grew up and i also started earning i was like okay maybe now we have uh, you know uh, like uh, more earning members to so think would be better mm-hmm. but it was uh, uh, like far from the truth and reality mm-hmm. because it was like you travel 2000 miles only to realize that the place is not accessible mm-hmm. or does not give you the kind of experience mm-hmm. that you would have looked forward to mm-hmm. or people would pass comments that uh, if you face so much trouble why do you even come to this place mm-hmm. and people are insensitive that way sure. uh so my parents are conditions like condition like most disabled people in the country ki let it be this is not mm-hmm. something for us and let's not get into trouble by asking uh, for anything in terms of access i think i was not ready to accept that and i picked up fights and arguments at places and one fight at a temple turned into a mob fight and that's when my parents said oh we are not going anywhere because it's never ending in a good experience and then i started looking for solution not to find any and uh, that was the tipping point and i was like what other people are doing so either they were not traveling at all or they were having same sort of challenges and i was like okay so this is a mainstream travel company is not going to look at it as a prospective business because disability is always linked to charity right so howsoever numbers you can tell people uh, it, they won't believe it right so i was like okay so let me do my homework i was in a corporate job and um, i worked with companies like hcl nogia adobe but i was like to convince myself whether i can pull it off mm-hmm. and uh, whether it is a financially sustainable business and um, so like good 2 to 3 years i did my homework in the sense because there was no data available so i had to create that data and uh, 
so I sat at airports overnight, various ones, <laughs> counting the number of people that are coming out. And uh, to my astonishment, there were not enough people coming out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even though they, uh, uh, airports are considered to be one of the most accessible places. Right. So I was like, um, okay, if the most affluent people, if the, at the most accessible place is not coming, mm. even though we have 1.3 billion people with disabilities in the world, it means something is really uh, uh, like uh, missing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so after that, um, once I was convinced somewhere in mid-2015 that, okay, I'm done with the homework, I'm convinced I can pull it off. Then it was every day at the work, like, okay, if not now, then when? You you will always have bills to pay and rent to pay, but um, uh, nothing's going to change if you wait a few, few years. Fabulous. And then and the rest is history. Yes. <laughs> well said. Well done. So, uh, you know, what are the challenges? that uh, differently able people or persons face seems to be infrastructure issues. How, what is your view of uh, infrastructure? You know, even something like a ramp for a wheelchair uh, is difficult to find. What are some of your issues, you know, uh, uh, experiences of similar challenges in India and outside India? So uh, the challenge more than the infrastructure remains the attitude. Mm -hmm. Because until and unless someone wants to or has the intent to make the change, Mm -hmm. nothing is going to change. You can ask for anything and everything. People won't be convinced that uh, there is a segment of society that exists and they have accessibility needs, which might be different from uh, their needs, mm. right? So it all starts from there because even if, you, if you're not willing to make it accessible, it won't change. Mm-hmm. I cannot go and change the monuments or uh, any of the infrastructure, which I don't own. Sure. And so, especially when it comes to traveling. Mm. So, and... Another thing that is important that we need to look at is accessibility is much more than a ramp and a disabled friendly toilet. Absolutely. Right. So there is a whole spectrum of disabilities that exist, like blind, deaf, or people with autism, uh, psychosocial, cognitive, intellectual disabilities. And many of these disabilities are not visible. Hmm. Many of them are invisible, yeah. right? So that's where people don't see right in the face that this person might have a disability and might have accessibility needs, which is not uh, visible at all right in the first go. So when it comes to India, yes, the infrastructure is not accessible. The attitude of, uh, we lack a lot of awareness in terms of uh, uh, like that this is needed Mm. because one, people are of dis- uh, with disabilities are not seen out in the open, enjoying the rest of the public spaces like others, because, of course, they are not accessible. Mm-hmm. And uh, most of the time, you just see them outside the temples, which is mm-hmm. not a good sight to see. Mm-hmm. So that that is the perception people have. Correct. So that perception, that lack of awareness and ignorance mm-hmm. is a bigger driving factor than anything that you can look for in terms of infrastructure or anything. And that, once that changes, infrastructure changes regulations we have uh, a law yes implementation we'll have to see how how many years it would take to get to that law Correct. and um, so uh, if i compare it to like you asked uh, to outside the country mm-hmm. at least the attitudinal barrier is much lesser mm-hmm. infrastructure in terms of uh, accessibility for wheelchair users is better but when I talk of accessibility for other types of disabilities, there also it's developing. Uh, they still have everything uh, behind a glass wall in a museum and no proper in a, uh, content and information not available in accessible format. So, so, so we're getting there. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of uh, the, the attitudes um, is a function of knowledge and awareness. So I guess that will happen. But in in a in a in a world where if you had the ability to make changes to infrastructure, have you thought of writing a paper or putting down what should be there? Because maybe a lot of these things are not happening because people don't know. Yes, of course. So uh, I write and speak at conferences. Like uh, writing has been on a lower side, but I do try to do as much as I can, mm-hmm. and uh, like. 
every opportunity that I get, I tend to talk about it. Rather, uh, more than that, when we are developing any destinations where our people travel, we develop the whole ecosystem where before anyone travels to any place. Mm -hmm. So by destination development, I mean, we go to the place, okay, what is the accessibility status and what we can do, whether temporary or permanent to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and this involves uh, interacting and convincing the stakeholders, mm -hmm. which includes uh, the tourist places like museums or uh, forts and palaces or anything that the public institution, that is public institution own, or the hotels or the storytellers or the guides and the transport companies. We train and sensitize all of them before anyone travels in that ecosystem. So yes, we, because there's no other way, like, and we are not even paid for that. Though now we are devising a system where they pay us for it. I think we are in a position to do that. But uh, so that is a gradual process that is happening. And I'm happy that at least with the passing of years, People have become more responsive, uh, whether it, the money has been the motivator mm -hmm. uh, that uh, yeah, people are coming and spending money for hotels, like because they stay longer and spend more. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you get good people at the places which help you out. Yes, this is important. We should be doing this. And then they become aware, oh, wow, we should do it. And that changes things. So very, very fascinating. So, you know, as someone in the travel and tourism business, I cannot not ask you this question how has the pandemic affected uh, you know uh, planet able like any other travel company travel has come to a standstill business hasn't been uh, like much to be honest mm -hmm. uh, once there was a bit of uh, opening in the lockdown relaxation in the lockdown mm -hmm. there was some domestic travel happening but all the international travel that happens is not there. I mean, that is uh, a lot of business to survive on. Mm. So um, I have rather so like financially, we I think we had a good year, so we could uh, pull it off mm. recently. And we have always been a lean business, so that helps. Mm. Now I realize mm. having bankruptcy earlier in the business helped because you're like, oh, you can survive bankruptcy, so you can survive that mm. kind of thing. Mm. Uh, but I took this time to uh, think of the gaps that exist in the industry right. and how to take it as an opportunity rather that uh, how as a travel service provider, how many people uh, you would be able to impact in any year. Mm. The best of travel companies do 100,000 or 200,000 people when they have operate in 100 countries okay. and which are 30 year old. So how do you reach out to 1.3 billion people? So that is where all the thinking has been that even though someone might not be able to afford to travel with us, how can we impact and make better their lives when they come to when it comes to traveling for them? Okay. So it's like reinventing the business and making it planetable 2.0, like that's buzzword these days, mm -hmm. the 2.0. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we are doing. Fantastic. And which are some of your favorite destinations uh, for your travelers in India and overseas? Uh, so our travelers in India love uh, Kerala mm -hmm. uh, for the various reasons. I mean, not just as a destination, mm -hmm. but also as uh, in terms of hospitality. I mean, just the tourism industry and the people is just much more open and uh, sensitive towards the need. It just happens to, to have good hospitality providers there than any other part of the world, okay. which I think uh, extend beyond hospitality, if you know, mm -hmm. uh, understand across mm -hmm. industries, yes. it's the day. So that is a good popular destination. And up north, it's uh, like uh, Dharamshala is one because mm -hmm. of, of course, the, the Lai Lama and uh, all of that, that attracts a lot of people and the weather. Um, outside India, um, Singapore is a very popular destination uh, because it, one, it happens to be just midway in between either from people from Australia or New Zealand or people from coming from Europe uh, or US. That is one a popular destination. Um, so uh, and plus it has a good accessibility. Uh, like they have done a really good job. Absolutely. I agree. So, I agree. yeah. And of course, like uh, Europe is there. Uh, oh. Germany is one popular destination, uh, which we had a lot of, what do you say, requests from people. Mm -hmm. 
which we were supposed to open in 2020 but yeah here we are <laughs> thanks to the i'm Bengal. sure i'm sure uh, there would be you know, times will come sooner than later when hopefully life will come back to normal sure. but you know a question that i have often asked a lot of my guests who are in the travel industry is about uh, the the so called ugly indian traveler you know uh, and i've experienced this many times um, you know with i've traveled extensively and you wonder you know why what is it that some people start demanding what are, what have been your thoughts on uh, travelers uh, like that <clears throat> good question uh, so yes there is a thing that you know um, indian travelers are not as what do you say sensitive or um, uh, so to say yes they are very demanding mm -hmm. um, so for example if i give you our own example uh even with people with this, even though we don't say that we cater to only people from uh, other countries to india um and not the indian travelers which many of the companies choose to do mm -hmm. we are open like anyone and everyone traveling from anyone to everywhere so uh that is there but still it remains like you know they uh i think they are still to get uh, raise their bar of expectation mm -hmm. and value what they are getting out of the money no one is trying to con them people are actually nice and looking at their benefit hmm. but uh, there is an attitude that indians try to grab um, is just a cultural thing that we want to uh, get as much as out with as less the money but hmm. businesses don't, can't run that way okay. you cannot deliver service until and unless you uh, pay like as uh, you charge more so for example for me a lot of people come to me asking uh, can you do this in this much money and all of that uh even though it means saying no to business i have to say because if the experience goes bad no one remembers how much you paid people okay. only remember that what was the quality of service and was was the experience mm. it's good that they realize that many indians are i think getting aware of that especially the new uh the the generation or even uh, the previous generation who is uh, who is well traveled globally and is aware the value that they get out of um, uh traveling and how much work gets into uh, making it happen okay. i think we are changing but it's still some time fascinating and uh, you know you just spoke about the younger generation that is my next question how are the millennials and the gen z's changing uh, expectations of uh, travel uh, because they're only looking for experiences yes so even i uh, like i'm one of the millennials if you can yep. say mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes we uh, the generation looks at travel more as an experience rather than the bucket list ticking spot and uh, i think that's the best way to travel that's the way i like to travel too myself mm -hmm. that uh, you know just loitering around the streets and talking to strangers and you know just getting inside the coffee house and uh, striking a conversation with someone from some other country for that right. matter mm -hmm. and just randomly having a meal with them too so um um what we at planet table also try to create is i never try to, if someone from other countries coming in and they are asking for the like conventional golden triangle and a taj mahal visit mm -hmm. uh you cannot in a way tell them no you don't go there it's overrated and all of that you tell them okay yeah this is a place you want to go but why don't you check out the elephant rescue center as well which is right there in the backyard of uh, agra and i promise you 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 would come thanking to me that it's a great experience mm. so we try to inculcate and add on those authentic experiences mm. into those trips and it has been a great welcome um, uh, move by people not just the millennials and gen z no, but, but even the elderly yeah yeah is this have, how do you tell them that yeah this is you might want to have a look at that too uh, kind of a thing amazing so. amazing so now i'm now going to move to the last segment of our conversation which have few questions for you personally uh, my first question is that uh, you know you were in the corporate world and now you're running planet table as you look at uh, you know all the everything that you've done what would you say are three milestones or pivot points in your life or your career in my life and my career pivot points okay 
Um, so the recent one I would say has been to start Planet Able. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the biggest pivot in my life that I has uh, I have ever done. Mm-hmm. Um, I have had a few other uh, entrepreneurial in, uh, stints as well in the past. So uh, uh, that was one of another where I left the job at Nokia to start a chain of chai, uh, chai mm-hmm. point type, uh, uh, like uh, tea That's stops cool. kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And that was way back in 2011 when uh, chai point or chaios were not there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but all of these things were more of, you know, to do something different. Or I think it just comes as a nature to some mm-hmm. people to try something doing different. That was another pivot point. And um, another, I would say, is just on the cards when I pivot. Uh, I'm not, I won't say pivot. Like, okay, I'm just talking about business. It's not mm-hmm. personal. Okay. <laughs> I just realized. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that I did not choose, like, so for example, after 12th, I wanted to become a pilot. Mm-hmm. And uh, that hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so third would be that when that happens. Okay. And I know uh, when I get a private pilot license. So Fantastic. Fantastic. That is what my third pivot of life should be. Terrific. I look at. My next question, Yuneha, is that, uh, you know, you're running such an amazing organization, helping so many people see so many different parts of the world. From where you stand today, what does success mean to Neha? Success, I think, means to me that at the at the end of the day, even if I have had an eighteen year, uh, eighteen hour day working in different time zones, uh, that like sleeping exhausted, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, people at the end of the day telling you, "Oh, you gave me the best day of my life," mm-hmm. or "I never thought this was possible, but you could make it happen despite uh, whatever that was." Mm-hmm. I think these kind of things that people mm-hmm. tell you. Uh, I mean, yeah, you like, yeah, you've done something right, whatever it took, or uh, I can sleep peacefully, exhausted and drained. Like, as what they say, you arrive at your end of your life completely battered and torn. That is, I think, success means to me that you ha- have have no regret about you did not try something. I did. Maybe I failed, or maybe I succeeded, but it was a great life lesson, and I don't have any regrets. So why I didn't do it. Terrific. Um, two more questions for you. Uh, my next question is that who or what inspires you to keep doing such amazing stuff? Who or what? I think uh, one inspiration, biggest inspiration has been my parents. Um, and um, if I look at it, I think uh, living, uh, like being born to parents with disabilities, I take it in a positive way because um that puts me in a very unique position of understanding how different disabilities work Mm -hmm. and um, having been very independent early in life as a choice that my parents made for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that gives us life skills that most of the peers I've seen are not having. So I was depositing my school fees at six in six standards myself going on a cycle. Uh, So I think um, uh, that experience and having looked at them and experienced that life is what my uh, in- inspiration is and would always remain. And the other is having had the opportunity that you uh, have a purpose that can change the whole travel industry for the ma- for for the future. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're in a place that you've been given that. I mean, somewhere I feel that I you know I find myself in a unique position to. Have been born to parents like that and uh, taken that uh, initiative and mm-hmm. doing decently well. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's a responsibility that I have, and you have like that's what inspired me to change, to continue to change uh, the industry for the better fantastic. and make it inclusive. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, we've come to the end of the conversation, so thank you so much. What an amazing journey yeah. you've taken me on in the last 24 25 minutes. Uh, you know, when you spoke about uh, the Taj Mahal and you talked about the Elephant Rescue Center, that's a new thing I learned. I've been there God knows how many times, but I've never been there. So that's something I've learned. And next time I go there, I'm going to look for it. Sure. But thank you again for an amazing conversation and good luck. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much.
Thank you for listening to the brand called You Video Cast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.